The Coffee People podcast is presented by Roastar Coffee Packaging. Roastar is a digital printing company that makes custom printed packaging for coffee products. They make even small roasters look like a really big deal. At Roastar.com, you'll find out about their fast turnaround time, high quality products, and low printing minimums. Roastar will quickly become your favorite source for custom American-made product packaging. Roastar works with small, mid, and large coffee roasters. So if you're ready to upgrade those bags or coffee tins, go to Roastar.com to learn more and connect with the team. You'll find the link in the Coffee People Podcast's show notes. Do you want to make a podcast? Check out Spotify for Podcasters. Spotify's platform lets you easily make a new show, then distribute it around the world. You can even monetize your podcast. It's all in one place, and it's free. It's Spotify for Podcasters. Here's how it works. You use Spotify for Podcasters to record and edit shows right from your phone or computer. You can literally start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Beyond the audio realm, Spotify for Podcasters also has video podcasting tools, not to mention the ability to connect directly with your podcast listeners. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including paid ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free. It all sounds pretty good to me, so good that I'm using my platform to recommend anyone starting a podcast give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started. Got a little tangenty anyways, so a little bit work. Tangents are what this show is all about. I mean, I, I keep <laughs> asking you something and, and then thinking, you know what? I should have asked them about this. I'm going to go back to that. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Coffee People podcast, which is part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network. I'm Ryan Wolt, and this is the show where we get to know coffee people. Often it's coffee roasters or green coffee buyers or cafe owners, but coffee touches so many different people in so many different industries. Today I'm chatting with Nick Schmidt, who works for this show's sponsor, Roastar. Nick and I met last fall at Coffee Fest LA, which is also how I found out that the company that produces some of my favorite coffee packaging is based in my hometown of Wausau, Wisconsin. I'll be honest, before meeting Nick, I hadn't thought much about coffee packaging, other than to admire some cool artwork or a well-designed bag. My biggest packaging concern was to figure out how much longer I could shove coffee bags into the kitchen drawer before it burst. That changed when I met Nick. It was a reminder that every cup of coffee I enjoy either at home or out in the world, has connections to an entire world of people, an entire world of entrepreneurs and small businesses that I never think about. Technically, we are between seasons 7 and 8, but I wanted this show to come out now because I'm going to be seeing Nick and the Roastar team at the Specialty Coffee Association Expo in Portland this weekend. I'll even be hanging out in their booth on the vendor floor on Friday and Saturday afternoons, There, I'll be interviewing visitors about their own coffee passions and ambitions. So if you're in Portland, I hope to see you at Booth 954. Until then, I hope you enjoy this Coffee People podcast conversation featuring Nick Schmidt of Roastar, preferably accompanied by a good cup of coffee. Um, I don't really think so. This is uh, my first time ever speaking in any format like this, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. Nervously excited, I would say. Oh, you'll be fine. Uh, it's just a conversation for the most part. Yeah. And we'll start by saying welcome to the show. If you could tell everyone your name, who you work for, and your title there, and uh, maybe your favorite movie ever. Yeah, my name is Nick Schmidt. I work here at Row Star. Uh, in Wassa, Wisconsin. I'm an inside sales and service representative. My favorite movie of all time. That is tricky. You know, as far as uh, 
history goes, I'm going to say it, the Princess Bride. That's what I was what I was raised on. Wow, that's a that's a throwback. That's my wife's favorite movie. Okay. We actually got a chance to see. It was really cool. They brought back the entire cast, living cast of the Princess Bride, to do a reading of the script. Oh, really? Two years ago, during it was like a COVID thing, and we we watched that. I think it was actually on behalf of the state of Wisconsin that that's how they did it. You are based. I think we should just get it out there in Wausau, which is my hometown as well. Although we have never interacted outside of Wisconsin, only in Los Angeles, uh, <laughs> where we met. I love Wisconsin. I think it's one of the most beautiful places. Uh, I haven't lived there in like 12 years, so I'm probably going to hit you up for some good coffee recommendations after this. But I wanted to ask, are, have you always lived in Wisconsin or did you move there for this job with Rostar? Um, I have lived in Wisconsin. Yeah, I am born and raised here. Haven't lived anywhere else uh, yet, that is. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I really do. Yet, that means you're thinking about somewhere else in the world. Is that uh, Do they know that at Rostar? <laughs> they do. Yeah. I, I don't know how soon, you know, I, I like coffee. I like the atmosphere and, and people that it brings. And I, not that there's necessarily a lack of it in Wassa, but yeah, I, I'd like to see a little bit more of the world. Well, let's get started with a little bit about you and uh, your experience in coffee. You just mentioned you enjoy coffee and that wasn't necessarily something I presumed based on your job title, uh, <laughs> which I'm going to get to in a minute. Cause I don't have any idea what it means. But did you have kind of a first experience with coffee that made you think, yeah, this is interesting, or that when you look back, you remember it as like, oh, this was kind of the start of uh, this thing that I'm interested in? Yeah, I mean, coffee definitely isn't a requirement to work at Rose Star, but it's something I carry. So I would say my, my first kind of, wow, this is cool moment was uh, at my first job as a barista, I, I did a coffee tasting with just a, a shot of espresso and it was really kind of my first time drinking coffee intentionally and, and thinking about what it actually tastes like to drink this coffee, aside from, you know, the caramel macchiatos I had had prior. And it was really cool to like actually think and talk about coffee with other people and kind of what, what we liked and what we didn't like. So that was kind of eye opening. Do you remember where that was? Do I have to say it? <laughs> uh, but <laughs> my, my first job was as a Starbucks barista. In coffees. So it, it was really cool. I, I do think I was blessed with a, a good crew that genuinely cared about coffee. So those regular coffee tastings did help to kind of instill that passion a little bit from the start. You know, Starbucks has uh, their issues. They're certainly in the news a lot lately. But without Starbucks, there's an entire generation of people who wouldn't have gotten into coffee. And I say that knowing where you're from, I'm from the same place. When I was a kid, when Starbucks opened, that was a big deal. The only other place to get coffee was Denny's. So uh, we didn't have a lot of options. So they brought coffee of a certain level to a large swath of America that hadn't seen it before. And yeah. so if nothing else, uh, we can be thankful for that because you may not be you know, where you are now uh, without it. Exactly. Tell me a little bit about Rostar, what it is that you you guys do and, and how you are integrated into the coffee community. Yeah, so we are a packaging company. <laughs> we make bags. Uh, we also make uh, tin cans. And the biggest kind of niche about us is that we do it digitally printed. So pretty much all of our products are going to be, uh, you know, custom made. Uh, we really do present ourselves m majorly in the coffee industry. We, we kind of got our our start actually at the San Diego Coffee Fest. We presented a, a digitally printed coffee bag and it won Best New Product. That was back in, I think, 2011. And it was kind of interesting because uh, we weren't really ready to make a coffee bag yet and we didn't have any customers. But it was a, <laughs> a great idea that, that kind of got it started. Well, since then, you have you have focused quite a bit on coffee. When I go to your website or when I met you at Coffee Fest LA, you have a niche. You do packaging in other industries, but coffee seems to be what people know you for. Even your name, Roast uh, Roastar, is, is, is coffee uh, related there. You've come a long way since then. Who are some of like the clients that maybe people would know? I mean, are you doing large coffee industry? I mean, is this, are you doing packaging for like pizza or Starbucks or is it more on a smaller scale, small business, medium-sized business? Totally. I mean, our big thing is small business, big story. So majority of our customers are really going to be pretty small, often startup shops. 
a couple that, I mean, I've started really small. We worked with uh, Death Wish is probably a name that you would know. So we, we you know, have made their bags um, and then they got that, that Super Bowl commercial deal. I, I don't know if you recall that. They really blew up big time, which was really cool. They, they've grown a lot, uh, have some really interesting branding and marketing. So that's kind of one of the ones that, you know, it exploded and got their name out there pretty widespread. And I think one of your other, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but you, you guys worked with Black and Bold? Yeah, yeah, we have done some eggs for Black and Bold as well. So Black and Bold was just in the news yesterday. Um, they're going to be taking one of their their pre, pre-made pre uh, craft instant coffee packaging nationwide. Uh, oh. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's very cool. One thing I like about coffee is that it, it connects people across across the country, across the world, really. It's a product that we're all that is so integrated into the daily life of most people that you don't even realize how many other businesses you're working with or you're touching base with when you drink your coffee in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the reasons that I enjoyed uh, learning more about Roastar and about and now about you and of course Danielle and the team there, because I never would have thought about as much as I think packaging is cool and the designs are cool and the artwork is cool, I wouldn't have thought about it when I was drinking my coffee. So I'm hoping you can explain a little bit about how that process works from I, I'm a coffee roaster and I want to package my beans and I call up Nick. How does that work? What happens next? Our process really starts with uh, selecting what bag is right. We have different options, different styles of bag, all kind of present, you know, some are more of a classic style, like the gusseted style bag. The flat bottom is a little bit more forward and modern, I would say. You got to align on kind of what bag represents what you want to show with your brand. And then starting out with digital printing and, you know, a a fully printed coffee bag is really cool. So it's it's maybe not where every roaster starts. Commonly, people will be coming to us uh, and they're currently using a a blank bag with a label put on it. That's a a very easy, you know, most roasters start in their garage and and have a blank bag that they write, write handwritten with a Sharpie. Um, so we're kind of that next step, ideally starting with pretty low runs is, is what we specialize in. So we can start as low as 500 bags and you can split that up with, with up to five different designs. So you can really go as low as a hundred bags per design, which is, is pretty crazy to be able to differentiate your, you know, your light roast and your medium roast and whatever, maybe single origins you have. So that's a very cool way that people start out with us. Artwork is a really big piece of it too. A cool wig bag doesn't just happen. Uh, hiring a designer is a pretty big factor. I do have a lot of customers that, that like to take on the design themselves. It's just uh, kind of fun to work through, but achieving that that brand look is really best done through a designer. So we, we don't offer design services in-house, but we do have quite a few designers that we've kind of come across over the years. And we kind of put those together into a list. So. Obviously, any designer can work with our, our templates to create the artwork for those bags, but it's it's kind of convenient to have that resource of people that, you know, I know some of them by name and be able to email with the designer and, and get those bags lined up just right. What I was going to refer to when you're talking about working with designers is I was actually a packaging designer at one point. And so there's a very specific skill set that comes with knowing how to design around the limitations of a product. So yeah. knowing where your design is going to get folded underneath, like say the edge of the bag or underneath the valve or knowing all those things, it's not as easy as just saying, here's a really cool thing I did, put it on the yeah. bag, right? You know, exactly. there's all these little details that come with it. And, and not even that, how the colors will look on the bag itself, whether they're going to print the way they look on your screen versus uh, on a matte bag or a glossy bag or, you know, whatever the, I, I don't even know, but whatever the liner of the bag is. Yeah, no, no, you're exactly right there. And I mean, that is, that's a huge thing is the translation from a computer screen to ink on material. We do actually have free printed flat proofs of all of our uh, products. So that's a, a pretty important thing that we really do try and urge people towards is if time allows, getting it printed out first. It's, yes, one way to double check last minute spelling errors and stuff if that hasn't been caught, but really the the colors and, you know, getting that approved to make sure color is spot on. 
As a still part-time graphic designer, there is always a last minute spelling issue. <laughs> I'm working on a book cover right now and I've had at least 10 different people go over this book cover and we still found a spelling issue after that. <laughs> so it's just your brain, your brain puts things in the right place, even if they're not there. So you really need to look at it from a different angle. So having a designer who's worked with that is great. And, and on that note, I noticed uh, on your Instagram, uh, maybe last week you posted about, or the company posted about. Uh, you're going to be sponsoring the design awards at the Specialty Coffee Association Festival in Portland. Yeah, yeah, the the product design awards, which is pretty cool. So we should just establish now that if the winner doesn't work with Rostar, is that possible, or are you like, are you stacking the deck for Rostar? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know that we're quite stacking the deck. Uh, I I actually <laughs> don't have any insight on who's registered for that. So I, I am excited to see the results of that at the at SCA. Uh, will you be at the at the event in April? I will, yeah, I will I will see you there. I, I hear that we're gonna be partnering up with a pretty cool up and coming coffee podcaster. <laughs> there, so. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you still let me, you know, a lot can happen in three weeks, we'll see what happens. <laughs> People listening to this, this is gonna be coming out right before SEA. So this is probably happening as you're listening to this, but hopefully I'll be showing up at the Rostar booth at Specialty Coffee Association in Portland and doing some like live podcasting right there on site in the afternoon. So if you're there, come check them out. I wanted to to go back to something uh, from your past, not Rostar or coffee related, but I think I saw that you worked at East Bay for a while, which I yeah. think is a a seminal job for every young person growing up in, in the town of Wausau. Uh, East Bay was a massive catalog sporting goods store that uh, in the 90s was bought by uh, Woolworths. Uh, I worked in the warehouse when I was 15 and I worked in the store when I was 17 and I worked in the phone bank at one point. Mm -hmm. They recently announced that they're shutting down their iconic kind of sports catalog. What was your experience like with East Bay? And, and do you do you even realize like how uh, pervasive they were on the job economy in Wausau? Yeah, I, I guess I didn't really realize how how much how widespread they were. But it definitely was a, a pretty key thing. I have a lot of friends that also worked at East Bay. Um, I did work in the call center there. So I, yeah, I took calls in from um, East Bay and then like Foot Locker is another branch. Uh, there are quite a few actually, but they all started with East Bay and there was the, only the one East Bay store, which is kind of cool. I did actually for one summer volunteer to do an overnight shift on Sundays with a friend. So that was kind of an interesting summer of Sunday overnight call center <laughs> shenanigans. <laughs> uh, a lot of phone calls from prisons, I always found. Uh, yes, yes. That's where the catalogs made it. And, I, and you can tell me if this happened to you, but for me, I would get a phone call, especially around the holidays, uh, from somebody in a prison wanting to buy gifts for their kids, you know, the newest shoes or jersey or whatever. But then once we did the order, which took all of a minute, this was their only phone call of the week. And so they would want to talk uh, to me for like <laughs> 10 minutes uh, about sports or about what was happening in the news, anything, because they wouldn't get another call for another week. So I don't know if you ever had any experiences like that. Uh, but it was something that like really made me appreciate one, not being in prison, but two, uh, learning how to talk to people from all over the world. That is really cool. I, I, don't think that I was anyone's uh, comfort from prison. However, I, that is a, that's a good story. I did definitely have quite a few sneaker orders that I placed from people behind bars getting either either some shoes to them to you know show off a little bit or but yeah for the family and friends. Oh, I didn't even think of that that you could bring, get shoes inside. <laughs> Back to Specialty Coffee Association. What is uh, what is it that you guys are planning on doing there, and how does an event like that? help represent your brand or help push what you guys are doing as a packaging company forward. I think when I say specialty coffee association, people just immediately go to like the barista competitions, the roasting competitions. That's what they think of. They're not thinking of like a, a manufacturing packaging company. Yeah. I mean, it's where we got our start. I, I suppose I'll share. I, I said that earlier, the San Diego coffee fest is really where we kind of found our roots. So we've, 
always found ourselves at those different coffee shows, SCA being the biggest of all of them. This year, we've got a pretty sweet new booth, which we're really excited for. Partnering with you is going to be exciting. Um, it's always cool as well to strengthen some of those relationships with existing customers we have. I'm on the front lines. I, I work with all of our customers that are in Portland. So to be able to randomly bump into people I email with on a daily basis is going to be pretty sweet. Why don't you, uh, uh, if you can, just tell us what it is that you, your job title, you had this long job title at the beginning of our conversation. And I, I can't say I really knew what it meant. Uh, the only yeah. way I understood was sales. So what is, yeah. what is it that you do uh, on a daily basis? Yeah, um, it's, it's pretty heavy on customer service account management. So, I mean, I, I pretty much handle our customers' projects, customers on the West Coast, that is, all the way through from start to finish. So, um, you know, the, the stage, like I mentioned, of artwork setup, if you, uh, you know, need to get another round of proofs because your color was wrong on the first one, I'll, I'll help get that processed and get those on their way. You know, I can watch your orders and make sure they go through if you give me a call and say, hey, we screwed up. We need these bags, you know, next week, Friday. I can probably uh, maybe pull a few strings to, to figure out how to make it happen. It's tough to answer straightforward what exactly I do, but I kind of manage projects. I'm, I'm the guy that people call. <laughs> yeah, you're the facilitator. You're, the, you're not Jason Bourne. You're the guy that makes sure there's money and guns in his account. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about that Wausau area in the Midwest in general. You just mentioned that you work a lot with West Coast clients. And I, that's something that I have learned recently that you guys work with clients kind of all over the place. But I would have just assumed, I think, that you would have started with a lot of clients in the Midwest. What is that coffee culture like there? And I, I asked that knowing that when I moved from Wasa 12 years ago, there were no coffee roasters in town. Mm -hmm. and I think now there's probably several, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, but how do you see coffee growing in the Midwest? And as a company based there, how does that affect what you guys do? Yeah, we definitely have a, a few pretty good sized coffee roasters in the area now. We did start off, I know one of our earlier customers was Condor Coffee Company. They're a roaster literally about three minutes down the road. Um, and they, they started, I think, around 10 years ago as well. Um, and we've, we've done pretty much all their bags since they started. And it's always been a good relationship. Another, another local roaster is uh, Redwood Street Roasters. They rock. Um, they, they supply us with all of our coffee in the office. So we usually we have a, a cold brew keg that's always refilled. They, I think, really spread the coffee culture the best in the area because at farmer's markets, they do strictly pour overs and they have a, a huge line of, of people watching these pour overs be made. And I really don't think that a lot of people are even familiar with that as a brewing method. So they, they really kind of instill some coffee passion in the area, which is so cool to see. We do bags for, for definitely people in our hometown as well. Uh, I mean, a little bit further outside, but still in the Midwest. Dark Matter Coffee is a, a really cool brand. That was my very first cup of uh, craft coffee ever was a Dark Matter Coffee. No kidding. Yeah, they are. I mean, so cool with the art and music and just real, real nitty gritty of, of coffee. So... That's a, a very cool kind of further outside relationship. How do people find you? I mean, is it mostly from like festivals or events, uh, association events like that? Or, I mean, Googling, what is the best way for, say, a young burgeoning coffee roaster who wants to get to that next level? Where are they finding Roastar and finding information about you? Or, or how do they first connect with you? Yeah, yeah, we are... Definitely pretty prevalent online. We're an e-commerce company. That's usually the easiest place to find us. Conveniently, people do find us at, you know, SCA and Coffee Fest. We're at all of those shows. So in person, that's a good way to connect. We also have been in, I believe it's Roast Magazine a few times. Um, so we, we sneak our way our way into different different areas to get spread out. But online is really where we thrive. That actually brings me to something that I didn't have in my notes. How long have you been with uh, Roastar? Yeah, I've been with, with Roastar uh, just under a year and a half. So I started there. 
So you would have come in about halfway through the coronavirus pandemic, which hit different parts of the country differently. Was mm-hmm. there any discussion when you arrived just about how about the growth of young roasters, of new roasters? I think I noticed a lot of people who had time during the pandemic to say, I want to take on a new hobby or I have this new professional goal. Those roasters would be kind of graduating to the level of needing bags at this point. Are you interacting with people whose story starts there or is that not something that you, you've seen as much? Wow, that's a cool question. I, I can't say that formally in the office we've had any major discussions on it, but I, I mean, I talk to customers on a daily basis looking to come to this kind of packaging. And yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely heard of people that have started during the pandemic. I myself started roasting some coffee during the pandemic. So yeah, I would, I would say you're probably spot on with, I, I can't quite speak to how many new roasters we had, you know, a few years ago. But I would imagine that probably started a bit of a trend with random home hobbies. You started roasting yourself. Why do that? And then what what is it that you're roasting? Has anything come out that you're particularly proud of? Oh, nothing nothing that I'm proud of at all, no. (laughs) A couple of good times. Uh, What was the motivation for even trying in the first place? Just to see what your customers are going through or because you have a passion for coffee or what was that uh, the impetus? It had started because I thought it would be a, a more efficient way to fuel my coffee uh, needs. That is not the case. Um, <laughs> re- re- <laughs> it takes about about 20 minutes to make what I can drink in about two cups. And it smells not at all like I thought it would when you're roasting. Um, it took me about about four years of working in coffee before actually smelling coffee while it's being roasted. And I imagined my my whole house would smell like I'm baking a fresh batch of brownies. And no, you're you're burning cherry pits if you think about it. So the end product is great. The process was not as glamorous. Well, that's the next step is building your own coffee roasting shed. With ventilation. Yes, with ventilation. Uh, In Wasa, you could probably get away with that, if I recall. We didn't get a lot of permitting for things back in the day. (laughs) Maybe not so much anymore. I wanted to uh, just ask you, you know, besides your own experience here roasting and, and the challenge of that, what is something that you've kind of learned about the coffee industry since taking on this job uh, and having your Starbucks experience? What is something you've learned about the industry that maybe has surprised you a little bit or that you've just been like, oh, that's really interesting, you know, in the last year and a half of working with clients from all over the place? I would say that probably the biggest thing was kind of a takeaway from Coffee Fest that I had is that how deep the industry goes. Like you said, you probably wouldn't really have thought twice about the packaging side of things. I also, until Coffee Fest, would never have thought about the sleeves that goes on your coffee. Um, you know, all those different products in the supply chain that really go into that that final cup. Um, you know, coffee sourcing and farming and and how many different elements there are has been really cool to see. Um, and I mean, working with mostly small companies, majority of the people that I talk to own, own the roastery that they are sourcing the bags for. And these are entrepreneurs that are very passionate about what they do and very willing to share. So that's kind of uh, one of my favorite parts is, is hearing from the, you know, the source themselves on, on how they got there and kind of what hurdles they've come over. That's something that I love as well. I mean, just yesterday, I did a coffee cupping at Mostra Coffee here in San Diego. And Mostra doesn't owe me anything. There's no reason for them to invite me into their private production facility to do it. But it was just a standing, hey, you like coffee, you're into coffee, you're part of this industry, we'd love to show you what we do. Mm -hmm. And I just I think that's such a great thing about the coffee community is the willingness to engage and also to share knowledge because I'm excited about this. Yeah. I think you're excited about this. Why aren't you as excited about this as I am? Let me show you how cool it is. And I, I get that a lot. I have to point out that we went to different high schools, which makes us natural rivals. I saw a photo oh, boy. recently that uh, Rostar did a job fair at my old high school, uh, Wasa West uh, High School. So if anyone's listening, that's the better of the two high schools in town. so i'm assuming that when we see each other in portland that there will be some sort of like 
physical battle that we have to get through before we can move forward with a professional relationship. Oh, it's on. Maybe some sort of like coffee arm wrestling, which should be a thing anyways. I'm not sure how that would work. (laughs) I'm going to ask you a two-part question. Normally, it's just a one-part question to end the show. The first part is, is when you go out into the world to get a cup of coffee, what is it that you order for yourself? Uh, It depends on where I'm going. If it's a a shop that I have high hopes for and I haven't been to before, um, I will order what I I call a, a hit and run. I didn't coin that. I got it from a different coffee shop. That's a, you know, a single or double espresso, a little ceramic mug for there. And I sip that while I'm in the shop and take a 12 or 16 ounce coffee to go. I think that it is just perfect. It gives me a a pretty well-rounded view on their coffee. And that is definitely my go-to. Otherwise, if I've been there before, usually I'm going to casually get a cold brew. um, And that's kind of my my go-to drink. When I am back home, and I will be in Wasa in late summer, where should I go to get a cup of coffee if not one of your clients, if not Condor Coffee or not Redwood? You should go to Tuckney Coffee Company. That is that is where I worked for a little while. Uh, it's under new ownership. They are hip and cool, and they have gorgeous plants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you had me at plants. I'll take bad coffee if they have good plants. It's like one of the few things that I'm excited about as much as coffee. <laughs> Nick, I really appreciate you spending some time on the show with me. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to know you more and getting to know Rostar more. If you're listening to the show, you know that Rostar is coming on as a sponsor of the show and a presenting sponsor of the Coffee People podcast. And I just couldn't be more thrilled uh, to be representing both you and my hometown by extension. And I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Ryan. I, I hope everybody didn't get too frustrated by two Midwest guys talking about bags. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't do that. Don't point it out. It makes it worse. It's like one of the only things people say to me when they go, if I say the word bags, they go, oh, where are you from? And I go, oh. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. Okay, here are some key takeaways from that conversation with Nick Schmidt. First off, The Princess Bride, a very solid favorite movie choice, and a great excuse to cut to this scene, which is a reminder to always ask the right questions. For context, Inigo Montoya is sword fighting with our hero, Wesley. You are wonderful. Thank you. I've worked hard to become so. I admit it, you are better than I am. The more you smiling. Because I know something you don't know. And what is that? I am not left-handed. <laughs> You're amazing. I ought to be after 20 years. Oh, there's something I ought to tell you. Tell me. I'm not left-handed either. So yeah, if you haven't seen it, definitely check out The Princess Bride. Back to those key takeaways. Rostar is a printing company which specializes in digitally printed packaging. Nick is their inside sales and service representative, which is a very professional way of saying he is the guy you call when you're trying to figure out what needs to be done. He's the customer liaison. To quote Nick, I manage projects. I'm the guy that people call. He mentioned that an ethos he and Rostar work by is small business, big story, and I really love that thought. Entrepreneurs are often storytellers. They're telling a story with their brand, their product, and with the communities they build. Even a small business has something to say. Small business, big story. I'm going to put that on a post-it note and tack it up in this podcasting closet. If you have a coffee industry story to share, and you happen to be at the SCA Expo in Portland this weekend, you know where to find me. I'll be the guy with the microphone at the Rostar booth, number 954, in the early afternoons. Look for the beard, the bald head, and probably the fanny pack. Finally, exploring the world is a great way to discover who you are and what you value. I encourage you to get out in the world, if and when you can. There is a lot of great coffee out here, not to mention more than a few people who might just change your life. You never know when you're going to read a name tag and think, 
Holy moly, this guy's from my hometown. So thanks to Nick for talking to me that day and today. And thanks to you for joining me on this bonus episode of Coffee People, featuring Nick Schmidt of Rostar. You can follow at Rostar on Instagram to see some of the cool coffee bags they've collaborated on with your favorite coffee roasters. And if you are a coffee roaster, either established or burgeoning, head to Rostar.com to see all of the services they can offer your business to help tell your big story. I'll include those links in this show's podcast notes and in the Roast West Coast Coffee newsletter, which you can find and subscribe to at RoastWestCoast.com. You can sign up for free, but if you've been digging in this podcast, please consider one of the paid subscription options. The money from our listener subscriptions is how we keep upgrading this podcasting closet, and it gets you access to all of our show archives forever and ever. Or at least until the internet crashes, and we all have to go back to playing Snake on our phones. If you're in the early stages of your coffee journey, RoastWestCoast.com is also where you'll find the brand new Coffee Smarter Education podcast. We just completed Season 1, and we're already hard at work on Season 2. If you want to improve your at-home coffee brewing skills or appreciate your going out to the cafe experience a little bit more, you want to be listening to the Coffee Smarter podcast. Search for Coffee Smarter on your favorite podcast platforms like Apple or Spotify. Then please take a second to rate this and that show. It really helps. In addition to this podcast's aforementioned presenting sponsor, Roastar Coffee Packaging, this podcast is supported by some great coffee industry partners. They are Camp Coffee Company, Coffee Cycle Roasting, Ignite Coffee Company, Morea Coffee, First Light Coffee Whiskey, Cape Horn Coffee Importers, Zumbar Coffee and Tea, Ascend Coffee Roasters, Moster Coffee Company, Steady State Coffee Roasting, San Franciscan Roaster Company, Crossings Coffee, and Hosea Coffee Source. That's all for today. I hope to see you in Portland. This episode of the Coffee People Podcast, which is part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network, is, was, has been written, produced, and recorded by me, Ryan Wolt. I hope this episode has found you happy, healthy, and with at least a thread of sanity left, enabling you to make it through the day. Always tip your baristas, and be sure to drink good coffee. Hey out there, thanks for listening. Did you know this podcast is a listener and reader supported creative effort? Some amazing listeners and readers have chosen paid subscriptions to the Roast West Coast Coffee Newsletter on RoastWestCoast.com. Those awesome people are part of a growing community who appreciate craft coffee, learning about coffee, and being inspired by the guests on this show. If you are able and this show has been going really well with your morning mug of your favorite coffee, please subscribe to the paid newsletter at roastwestcoast.com. Thanks for listening, thanks for subscribing, and thanks for drinking good coffee.